the science of feeding tomorrow. Pathway Intermediates. Well, as I said again, good morning. Uh, our mission statement in aquaculture nutrition is to build stronger animals. So the title of my presentation today is the nutritional pathway to the stronger or resilient shrimp. We want to make that strong man shrimp uh, to face the, the challenges of the environment of growth and production. So nutritional strategies for a stronger resilient shrimp for the 21st century. So, and thank you to Pathway to Medias for this hosting. Now then, um, let's see if I can, um, well, I'm not moving forwards very well. Uh, something's wrong with the, I cannot uh, change the present. Wait, ah, that's right. I'm doing it a different way now. Okay, right then. I want to remind you the fact that shrimp are very, very different to fish because they go through a lot of changes in their life uh, history. The production of shrimp necessitates different life stages. And we, we really have to cater and accommodate the varying differences in nutritional requirements for very um, complex morphometric changes and they go through a metamorphosis. So the early stages from the hatching of the, of the no-ply all the way through to the zoe and then uh, to the uh, mysis stages and the post larvae are very specialized areas of fish nutri aquaculture nutrition. So um, we use a lot of live food enrichment. We have to use live foods like artemia and algae at the initial stages. And that's a very specialized area, which we will not do too much today. This is for another day, because I'm going to concentrate on the later stages of production all the way through to maybe the on growing stages and up to harvest. That's the key areas for us today, but we're not going to perhaps address some of the more difficult areas like the live food enrichment and the larval stages in the hatchery. That's a very specialized niche area of, um, of, of feeding of shrimp. But you can see in the left hand side there, the right hand side there, the different stages and the, uh, and the, and the types of organisms we have to use to uh, feed the, the larvae at the, at the hatchery stages. But the post larvae is when we are very interested in the formulated feeds and the compound feeds for shrimp. Okay, so bear in mind that the critical phases of shrimp life cycle need live feeds, and then we make a transition to the dry or complete formulations. Now then, nutrition feeding. New concepts for shrimp production efficiency is at the heart of my story. Um, you may or may not be familiar with uh, the NRC Nutritional Requirements of Fish and Shrimp. It's a very good book that I have here, of course, but we have to be very careful not to rely on all our knowledge of shrimp nutrition from something that's been published uh, in 2011. A huge amount of research has been done uh, since then, lots of scientific papers, and we should always rely on building up our evidence on the latest scientific papers, but the fundamental nutrition of shrimp and fish is still a very important aspect. And so we can go to this book for that kind of fundamental referencing, but remember a lot of it is out of date already. The key to our story is that we have to formulate diets to meet the demands of the shrimp at the different life stages, as I just stated. We have to look at the early uh, post larvae nutrition, right the way through to starter diets, grower diets, and then move on to the finisher phases, where we are going to formulate diets to meet the harvest requirements of the animal. But if you look very closely, you can see there, there's different size categories, the types of the levels of nutrients that we have to cater for, protein, fat, fiber, moisture, and ash are the approximate components of the feed, but it's the protein and the fat and the other uh, micronutrients and uh, nutritional requirements have to be met by lots of other things too, which a lot of tables don't show. These are other you know, areas covered by premixes and feed formulations. More comprehensive data will be available uh, uh, depending on, on the resourcing that you look for. So diet nutrition is the main influencer of growth and development of shrimp. Complex formulations are based on the previous extensive research, which is covered by the NRC, but up to 2011. The diet is the key to effective immune and defensive systems, as well as growth. So remember, nutrition plays a bigger part than just the, the growth and 
a conversion of food into, into product. And we're going to be talking about this. Now, the general approximate nutrient requirements of shrimp is shown very nicely in this table. This is a, another uh, uh, slant to the previous slide. This shows the shrimp, different size categories from up to 0.5 a gram, up to three grams, up to 15 grams and up to 40 grams. You can see that there's a general decline, a, a reduction in the protein level as the, speed, as the fish uh, shrimp gets bigger and then the fat content of the diet will be proportionally reduced. So the, the nutrient density of the diet is always going to be relatively higher for the, for the younger juvenile animals. But there's a lot of variation around this. I don't want you to take these figures as, as basically, um, as, uh, don't take them in a, in, in a, sort of as, as if they were in stone. You have to be flexible with this data because different uh, conditions will dictate different nutritional requirements depending on the environment. But the primary consideration is the protein and fat oil percentage when you formulate a diet to meet the fundamental specifications. Protein and energy is linked very closely as we will see. Now, the optimum protein for shrimp formulations is something that is, I'm asked a lot about and we define the optimum protein requirements, uh, that level in the diet which satisfies the maximum growth or weight gain of the animal. However, this is open to conjecture because under different conditions, this optimization might shift on the environment relating to temperature, primarily temperature effects and um, salinity as well when it comes to shrimp farming. So we have to be mindful that the protein requirement is not set in stone, that that requirement is generally around this uh, new number here, but it can shift quite considerably depending on the species, the types of shrimp, whether it's monodon or vanamai or whatever. So we have to be very mindful of this. So vanamai data is something we have to obviously bear in mind is the dominant species being farmed now around the world. Right. Now, the protein requirement, as I said, is flexible, but the amino acid requirements are proportional to the protein requirements. So the amino acid requirements of uh, shrimp is, is open to a lot of um, nutritional um, research. And we know a lot about certain types of shrimp, like the, uh, the, the, the prawn, the tiger shrimp, and the monodon, and the uh, japonicus, but we have very little information on the amino acid requirements of the Pacific white leg shrimp. That's quite disappointing because, uh, you know, it's the focus of a lot of our attention because it's the more, more important one at the moment. So we have to be um, open to kind of utilizing data from other species and translocating that data across as far as we can do because we have nothing else to go on. It's a bit like the salmon and rainbow trout story. We have a lot of data for rainbow trout and Atlantic salmon, but we do have gaps in our information on specific amino acid requirements for many, many species of, of fish and of course um, shrimp as well. But here we see a complete picture for the rainbow trout and these uh, amino acid requirements are expressed as a percentage of the protein so it's a normalization of the amino acid requirements. So if you look across the tape, the, the columns, you will see that um, there's a very similar level if you express it as a percentage of the protein. So that is an important factor to bear in mind because then we can extrapolate the amino acid requirements across to different levels of protein in the diets. So the amino acid requirements of, a, of an aquatic uh, species is very, very much dependent on the protein level and the amino acid pattern or pattern is rather normal between the levels of protein if you express as a percentage of the protein. So be careful when you look at amino acid requirements as a, as a percentage of the diet because it's not always easy to translate. Okay, now um, if I just move my, my image here, I can see that, okay, the lack of essential amino acid requirements for vanamai is something to bear in mind, but these amino acids here, lysine, methionine, arginine, histine, and tryptophan, um, these are the top kind of five amino acids that we tend to look for to make sure we are satisfying the amino acid requirements um, of, of, of the shrimp, okay? Now, um, right, another way of looking at this is to uh, understand that the amino acid requirement pattern is proportional to the amino acids in the shrimp itself. 
So the amino acid levels in the diet in the bottom uh, line here, uh, the amino acids in the diets as a percentage, there's a very strong correlation to the amino acids in the flesh of the animal. So we have a concept here called the ideal protein. The ideal protein is that protein which has the combination of all the amino acids in the right pattern. And uh, in experiments where they've looked at mixing fish meal with soya bean meal, we sometimes get closer to the amino acid pattern of the animal itself. So fish meal, although it's our gold standard protein, isn't always the, uh, the protein that satisfies completely the, the sensitive amino acid profile requirements of the animal. So that's why other raw materials blended with fish meal can sometimes give you a better performance than fish meal alone. And that's why the feed formulations do contain other ingredients as well to optimize those amino acids. So the essential amino acid at retention and the dietary level as a percentage of the protein are very important correlations to bear in mind. Okay, methionine is uh, one of those I've, I've mentioned as being a very important for the, for the shrimp. And it's one of the essential amino acids that is considered the most limiting essential amino acids in commercial aquifers for shrimp. Because uh, plant ingredients like soya bean meal and other plant proteins, um, methionine tends to be one of the lower ones relative to what you find in fish meal. So methionine is, is, is a very important amino acid as it is for poultry as well. To meet the requirements for this methionine, nutritionists have to formulate the shrimp feeds very carefully and then we uh, sometimes would use intact sources of this amino acid or even crystalline amino acids added to the diets to complement the proteins. So there's a lot of interest in what types of methionine are available. Uh, there's L or DL methionine works very well. The L amino acids are the most important ones in terms of biological function, but the DL methionine is one which is uh, uh, important and available. But recently, um, various companies have been looking into MetMet, which is a methionine uh, dipeptide, and it's a more stable form of methionine, and it's uh, absorbed very nicely by the shrimp. It's uh, a methionine has a nice slow release into the shrimp, but it is stable to the water as well. So uh, MetMet is, is quite an important one now being looked at. And the Pacific white shrimp, if you look at the literature on the whole, the methionine requirement is ranging between 1.9 to 2.9% of the crude protein. So that's quite a variation, but that's generally what the methionine requirement is seen to be for the Pacific white shrimp in particular. Now, um, there are some other amino acids which are desirable to have. They may be conditionally essential for optimized production, but we may not hear too much about them. Glutamic acid, for instance, is a, a non-essential amino acid, but it's required under certain conditions, maybe higher than normal. So it's important for gut turnover of nitrogen, for instance, to make the other non-essential amino acids. There's glycine, there's, there's proline, which is important in the immune proteins and connective tissues. Cysteine, sulfur amino acid, which can spare the methionine. It can complement and spare our methionine requirements. And more lately, guanidinoacetic acid is a combination of arginine and glycine, which is important as a precursor for creatine, which is in a very important amino acid type structure for um, muscle development. It's not specifically and technically an amino acid, but it is composed of amino acids. And then there is taurine, which is a very uh, interesting one for um, in feline nutrition in cats. They require taurine, otherwise they go blind. But in fish too, there's a requirement for taurine, which is very abundant in animal proteins and fish meal. But when we start to reduce the uh, fish meal in the diets for shrimp, then we may be putting more uh, pressure on the requirement for taurine. And so we must be looking at taurine requirements when we have plant proteins, which are very uh, increasingly being used in diets for shrimp. So bear in mind these um, strange amino acids on the sideline. Now then, this is a concept which is very fundamental to our nutritional uh, formulations, and that is to optimize our protein to energy ratio. Um, it's not enough just to have the right level of protein, but we have to have the protein in relation to the energy. Energy 
in intake is the driver for growth and protein itself contributes to the energy and if protein contributes too much to the energy then there won't be enough protein for growth so it's a very uh, interesting uh, interaction so we not, must get better information about the protein requirements per unit of energy intake and here we see some information here that um, people have been looking at different protein to energy ratios for juvenile shrimp below one gram and above one gram and then for uh, animals which are under a gram, they optimize that they require 33 to 44 uh, percent milligrams of protein per kilojoule of energy. OK, and then for shrimp above a gram, for l I should say, they showed best performance between 26 to 30 milligrams of protein per kilojoule of energy. So these are terms that you should bear in mind uh, when we formulate diets for shrimp. And that energy is coming from a combination of oil, of lipid in the diet, and of course, carbohydrates, which shrimp can assimilate to some degree uh, better than, than, than some species. All right. Now then, uh, in relation to the energy and protein retention in, in uh, fish and other animals too, it's, it's quite interesting to compare uh, shrimp. And I've got a giant tiger prawn on the top there because uh, we can't have the information for everything, but we do our best. So we can see that the horizontal uh, red bars are calorie retention and the paler ones are protein retention in these animals. And we have to be mindful that um, aquatic animals are often stated to have a better feed conversion ratio than our terrestrial animals, production animals like um, beef cattle, pigs and chicken, especially with uh, beef cattle and dairy cattle have apparently very, very high FCRs. But it's not a fair comparison sometimes. We give uh, fish the benefits of having much lower FCRs, feed conversion ratios. But in reality, if you look at the efficiency of calorific retention and protein retention, they don't do so much differently. In fact, the, the tiger prawn and the, and the pig is very similar in terms of the efficiency of calorific retention and the protein retention bars are also overlapping. So in a way, in a way, this is to do with the amount of, uh, uh, of feed intake relative to gain. And we know that grazing cattle eat a lot and lot of dry matter and they consume and graze a lot of, lot of uh, uh, pasture and, uh, and grain, and they convert less efficiently in terms of FCR than, than other animals. However, when we look at it in a different way, these animals are all very, very similar in terms of efficiency. Okay, that's an interesting uh, twist to the story. Right then, um, lipids and oils are sources of energy. Principally, the fat in the diet is a source of energy, but triglycerides, the lipids and the oils are made up of triglycerides and uh, phospholipids and, and, and other non-glycerides making up the lipids. Okay, there are a number of components to these and we are all familiar with the story of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids and they are very, very important for the health of aquatic animals and human health as well. But we, we tend to think of salmon and trout and other carnivorous fish, oil, or, uh, fish which are, have high levels and demands for essential fatty acids, the marine fish particularly, at the larval stages. But Shrimp too have a very important balance requirement for essential fatty acids. Essential fatty acids um, are uh, found, as I said, in phospholipids, which are the principal components of cell membranes, but they're also uh, uh, involved in the metabolism of, of uh, and the synthesis of key metabolic um, hormones as well. So they have anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory function and they relate very strongly to the immune system. So essential they are to the diets. It's difficult to ascertain exactly the essential fatty acid requirements for shrimp, but a lot of experiments have been done at the larval stages for enrichment of the larvae, and we have found that there are some optimization characteristics here. But the omega-3 fatty acids, uh, you will be familiar with the C25, the eicosapentaenoic acid, and the conversion into docosahexaenoic or DHA. These are obviously very important for us as humans, 
but um, many species of fish rely on this omega-3 as essential hoofer fatty acids here. And then the counterpart is the omega-6 fatty acids, and they are found in, in plant oils, the, uh, the omega-3s principally in fish oils. And so we can see this translocation and uh, elongation into the costopentinoic acid from linoleic acid. So there are uh, important uh, components here in the fatty acid story of omega-6 as well. And the omega-9 series from oleic acid to uh, the higher hoofers from the omega-9 series are also possibly quite important during different stages of production. Okay, but the interesting thing is that we are using more and more plant oils in the diets of um, aquatic species at the expense of some of the fish oils. And I think it's very important to have that balance correct. Here's some interesting data for the estimated EFA requirements for different shrimp species. We have the fatty acids here, linoleic, linolenic, docosahexaenoic, ecosapentaenoic, and arachidonic acids. And you can see the total requirements for these. They tend to total up the DHA and EPA here. And you can see that uh, the requirement for M. japonicus um, would be something like uh, 0 0.9, 0 0.9. And uh, we can see the, uh, some data missing for the monodon for arachidonic acid, which is the, uh, uh, from the omega-6 series, arachidonic acid. So um, generally, vanamai seems to have less of a requirement as a percentage of the diet than its counterparts, japonicus and monodon. So um, that is open to debate because more research is needed to validate this. But uh, in relative terms, vanamai seems to have a less of a requirement for those essential fatty acids than some of the other species. Um, there's a lot of papers coming out um, on the omega-3 fatty acid enrichment of shrimp from algal oils as well. Algae oils, marine algae oils contain high levels of the uh, omega-3 series. So that's, that's an important step in, in perhaps uh, towards harvest in enriching the vanamai to have higher levels for human consumption. Okay, and here's an interesting um, profile. You can see in general terms, in general terms, there's an improved performance with hufa long chain fatty acids in the diets, both omega-3 and omega-6 series. Here we see them here, the N minus three and Arachidonic is an omega-6, and you can see here that there is an improvement in weight gain if the diet contains higher levels of these uh, compared to baser levels. Uh, linol linoleic acid is the precursor to arachidonic and found in uh, plant oils. So it's a good thing to perhaps use uh, fish oils in the right combination here to enrich the diets and get better performance. So in general, omega-3 fatty acids had superior nutritional value over omega-6 fatty acids. When comparing the hoofers and poofers, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is shorter chain, the former offered greater nutritional quality, exemplified by the two major ones, that's uh, docosahexaenoic uh, uh, and um, DHA and icosapentaenoic EPA, okay? A very complicated area is fatty acids. It's not an easy subject to, to digest. And um, well, there are other essential nutrients for shrimp which are related to fats, and that is cholesterol, which is an important part of the membrane stability for controlling membrane function and fluidity in uh, animals. And cholesterol is, uh, might not be very good for us to have so much cholesterol, but for the shrimp, it's an important one. And it's a precursor for many, many hormones as well, which are important in shrimp metabolism. Um, phospholipids, of course, are the principal components of cell membranes and metabolism. And we have uh, phosphatidyl, uh, serine, choline, and inositol as key members of the family of the lecithins and phospholipids in general. And then we have the lysophospholipids, which are, if you look at the, the molecular structures here, you see that um, the phospholipids have a diacyl, they have the acyl chains here, which uh, give them two acyl chains and the, the base structure. And then, but in the lysophospholipid, we lose one of those chains. And then we have a very interesting molecule and pathway to mediates is the producer of lipidol, which is one very good 
It's an example of a, of a very good lysophospholipid, which has been shown to have very important function in other animal species. And now we are looking more and more into aquatic animal nutrition, and especially for shrimp, because uh, it might have a very key role in nutrient metabolic uptake and absorption across the cell membrane. So hence the interest now increasingly in, in lysophospholipids. Okay, and um, now then we must move on and um, we must look at, at, at trace elements for, for shrimp. Now, uh, I could put more than the, just the five I put there, but uh, let's look at uh, in relation to trace element nutrition, zinc, copper, iron, manganese and selenium are critically important as uh, components of metabolism and their functional role in a number of different processes and in terms of muscle development, growth in shrimp with a carapace formation, in wound healing, in neurological system support as principally enzyme cofactors and they are found in epithelial tissues, they are located in transport proteins and selenium, which is I've highlighted, is an important one for us as, an, as a primary antioxidant role in the immune function. And I've worked a lot with selenium and zinc, but selenium, I can tell you, is one of the most important ones involved in antioxidant and primary defense mechanisms at an enzymatic level. Okay, and all these things are a very uh, key components in disease resistance in the larval metamorphosis, as we looked back to the first few slides, uh, larval metamorphosis, the coloration of the shrimp, and of course in broodstock maturation and the production of eggs over would rely on these trace elements because they have to be found in the eggs for the developing larvae. So there's a huge role to play in the mineral nutrition and we are working at the moment on a number of these areas. Um, I'm working with colleagues in Mexico and in other, other parts of the world to look at trace element requirements for shrimp. And in particular, we have been looking at zinc. I'll just highlight one because we can't do them all today. But just to remind you that we can look at the variation of zinc in the diets in the, under controlled experiments and find a level which gives us optimum growth. However, that level may not equate with optimum health because under stress and other environmental challenges, the requirements might shift upwards to give us an optimum level, which covers many of those areas I, I mentioned earlier in terms of uh, metabolism, tissue repair, uh, immune function, they might have an extra demand. And so our requirement for zinc might necessarily have to go up. And the evidence we're finding in uh, studies in Mexico is that if we supplement zinc to diets which are already got zinc in them, in the premixes of the diet, we get much better performance under stress conditions. So our requirements may have to involve um, what I've called here supra, supra nutritional levels under stress. And that might be, might be true for other elements as well, like, like selenium and copper and iron uh, under stressful conditions. So bear in mind that don't look at numbers look at the reality of what's required on the ground because the textbooks do not tell you all of this. The textbooks will not be telling you sometimes the optimum health requirements above normal. I hope that's clear. And another interesting um, area that people are addressing and that is um, feeding the, the bio flock. This is the controlled um, flock of natural organisms at the microscopic level which is very important in shrimp farming. And they, they, the bioflock is a supplementary uh, source of nutrition as a stabilizing environment. It's an enrichment environment and many, many shrimp farms utilize the bioflock approach. So our feed formulations, when we, we have very intensive production, we may need the bioflock system to support the very high stock densities of the shrimp. So it's, it's been evaluated that silicon and strontium are elements which would be very, very important for the phytoplankton and especially the, those which contain an amorphous hydrated silica shell, which is uh, found in many of these diatoms and, and diatoms are a major part of the bioflock um, composition. So remember that there are some other elements there which are 
must be considered under certain conditions, apart from the major core uh, trace elements in aquaculture nutrition. And I don't want to leave the poor vitamins out, but I'm not going to emphasize too much today the vitamin requirements of the shrimp, because um, each one of these vitamins are very, very important, and they function as a group, uh, a, a suite of vitamins together, is, is uh, complementary to the metabolism of shrimp. And these are very uh, important in terms of stabilizing the, uh, uh, the metabol metabolic pathways, and they are key components of the metabolic pathways. These are parts of various types of um, relay systems, for instance, for energy and protein transformation uh, in the production of amino acids, in the synthesis of new amino acids, in the release of energy, such as thiamine, riboflavin, pyridoxine, pantothenic acid, niacin, biotin, to name a few. These are all critically involved in key metabolic pathways. Okay. And then we have ascorbic acid, vitamin C, which is uh, supplemented to diets for a number of species of uh, fish and shrimp, but um, they do not make sufficient amounts. Some species may make very small amounts of ascorbic acid, but we need to add vitamin C to the diet. And then we have the, uh, the fat soluble vitamins here at the bottom, and uh, more and more interest is turning towards vitamin D and vitamin E and K um, in relation to uh, changes to meet uh, specific formulations for different species under different conditions. So we need to reevaluate the vitamin requirements, both water soluble and fat soluble for shrimp. The data is very fragmentary. It's not very clear and you won't find it in a nice cohesive um, approach. It's very fragmentary. So the ideal scenario that we are trying to aim for is high survivability. There's a lot of mortality in the shrimp industry. And as you are practicing out there shrimp production, you will know better than me. Uh, there's variations on that date figure. Don't take them as written in stone, as I say, but they are generic general figures that the survival rate for larval stages to market size at best is about 60%, but it can be much less than that. The feeding rate itself is variable, depending on the stage of development, from say 16% of body weight or more, to controlled feeding levels of 1.5% relating to the shrimp biomass as they get bigger. And the feed conversion is, is, is pretty good really, even though I've criticized the term uh, earlier on, uh, it's around 1 to, to 1.5 to, to 2 under very strict control conditions of good husbandry and good management. And the diet and protein levels are around 32 to 39% and the fat 8 to 10%. And the shrimp are reared to a marketable size. Uh, there are smaller, market, uh, smaller sizes in Mexico, but they are much bigger in other parts of the world, around 28 to 32 grams or even bigger. And the rearing period will depend on the harvest size, but roughly around 180 days um, from the larval stages to market. Although it's much, much earlier sometimes, depending on the final size uh, specifications required. So it's at this stage here, we get all the mortalities and losses, and these animals are very delicate. And here's a little slide here. You might want to read that in your own time, but you can see here, the different types of pellet in size, from crumbled pellets to micro-encapsulated diets to crumbled, and then to the larvae using micro-encapsulated and crumbled or flaked. These are for the, the juvenile shrimp at the, at the early stages of post-larvae. So they use crumbled diets or micro-encapsulated and crumbled, or even sometimes flaked diets for shrimp. And the that depends on, um, on, on local practice and local availability. But these diets tend to be more expensive. These are uh, the more expensive diets. And this is the replacement of the live foods, a gentle transition from dry, dry uh, from, from live food to the, um, the, the, uh, the diets which are designed to be formulated. Okay. Um, but here is now, this is not so easy to read, but you might want to, uh, when you see this presentation, uh, you can go back to it. The link will be there. But you can see here a very complex feed formulation profile for on-growing diets. And there's a multitude of raw materials here to meet the specification. Now, this is the kind of thing that you would have if you were going to generate diets using linear least cost formulation. 
or as, as often the case, Excel spreadsheets, and you would be putting in the diet, the specification, and the, the target that you require, the target protein, the target oil and energy, and then you would be putting the data profile in for the raw materials themselves, and uh, you press a button. If you're lucky to have a feed formulation system, you can press the button, and then you'll get a formulation that is supposed to be balanced and correct and least cost. It should be the lowest cost specification for the diet. But as is often the case, we override this sometimes because we want our diets to be the best and cost is not everything. Cost is important, but it's not everything. So we formulate our diets to our own inherent in-house recipes. And I'm always asked the question, what is the best diet for shrimp or whatever? The best diet will be depending on local available raw, raw materials and uh, local preferences. Okay, and then these are the components principally when you formulate diets for larger, uh, for the ongoing stages and beyond, the, um, the fish meal, the soya, the fish oil, premixes containing vitamins and, uh, and, um, and minerals are used. And then we are supplying the protein, the lipid, the fiber, the carbohydrate, the vitamins to make a shrimp feed. And there's the shrimp feed here which will be a combination of all of these components, okay? And they'll vary from very much around the world. Now then, the types of proteins and raw materials, and I've been working with a lot of these. I'm a big fan of animal byproducts. I'm interested in uh, blood meals and plant proteins and fish meal, of course. Fish meal is still a very important raw material. I, I do like fish meal in my diets. I don't like to see fish meal free completely, but Sometimes you, you have to go down that route. Uh, people are trying to reduce the fish meal. The goal in aquaculture and aquafeed formulation is to reduce our marine protein dependency. So that's a key goal. Okay. And then there's a lot of new generation of proteins, such as single cell proteins from bacteria, from uh, fungi, uh, yeasts and bacterial, algal sources. Uh, I'm involved with the trials for different species of fish to evaluate these and uh, increasingly uh, of great interest is the biofuel fermentation derived co-products such as distillers dried grains and uh, various types of yeasts which are used in the brewing and biofuel industries and these are byproducts which can be used very nicely in diets for fish and shrimp okay and we have to put that together to make a feed and extrusion is becoming an interesting um, aspect of this uh, area of technology, although shrimp diets can be made by conventional pelleting and it works very, very well. But extruded diets offer um, some convenience and they offer some advantages. That is increased water stability, uh, improved starch digestibility because you gelatinize the starch and you uh, uh, process the starch to make it more available for energy to increase the energy density of the diets. You get protein digestibility may be improved. You get lower nitrogen and phosphorus outputs because you get better bioavailability of, of phosphorus and nitrogen and you get increased digestible energy and the expansion allows varying, uh, varying improved texture. It uh, uh, offers less leaching of uh, nutrients into the water and you can generate slow sinking or fast sinking or even floating pelleted feeds, depending on, on the species in question. We want our shrimp feeds to be acceptable to the animal and therefore we want our shrimp diets to be uh, uh, available and we don't want them to float away or we don't want them to sink too fast. We want it to be right for the, uh, the environment. The disadvantages of the thermal damage to the vitamins can happen because of the extreme temperatures and pressures. It can uh, affect pigmentation of the pigments that we add to the feed and it can lower the activity of enzymes and it can damage the probiotics or any other feed additive that might be thermally sensitive. So we have to be careful when we use um, extrusion feeds, but they are very popular and increasing in popularity around the world, but they are expensive. The cost is a factor. And it's important to think about feed management because feed management is a big issue here. And we have to deliver our feeds properly. Uh, we don't want to um, make the very best diets and then find that we're not feeding them properly to the animal. It's, it's vital that we record the behavior of the shrimp under different conditions and that um, 
We have sometimes hand feeding operations, which is I like because you can see the behavior very easily. Or we have automation. Increasingly, automation is coming into the story. And now with the development of um, IT and uh, intelligent learning and um, uh, artificial intelligence, we can use um, very complex systems to monitor the shrimp and to have control systems operational from the cloud where we can deliver the food at critical timing and frequency to best fit the performance of the shrimp under various conditions. So that's becoming a really interesting scenario. And uh, this is uh, remote sensing and uh, quality water of the water and sensing of the water quality by satellites um, and drones even is now um, being looked at. So that's another area that we should never forget uh, in terms of uh, optimization of um, shrimp nutrition and feeding. Now, I mentioned animal byproducts. I, I love animal byproducts because there's a lot of very interesting um, functionality in some of the proteins. We talk about functional feed ingredients, but even the, uh, the raw materials that are used at macro levels have their functionality associated with them. And here we see a, a, a product which is feather meal. It's from the poultry feathers. And we can see here when we increase the ratio of feather meal to fish meal in diets for um, shrimp in Vanamai, and this is a study from a, a German uh, company, which I won't name, but uh, we can see here increasing growth performance when we increase the ratio of feather meal to fish meal in the diets for shrimp. And then we can see the reduction in cost. This is the cost reduction here. So there's a significant saving here in terms of the economics of uh, aquaculture production for shrimp when we're just replacing one ingredient with the other. And that's very really interesting. And then we see the, here the benefits to the immune system. Here we see with increasing, with increasing a level of uh, feather meal and poultry product, we see the total hemolymph production and total hematocyte count and mortality uh, can be affected greatly by the shift. So we see here TP, which is total hemolymph protein, is rising with increasing uh, feather meal. We see here uh, total hematocyte, hemocyte count is increasing, which is relating to the immune system of the shrimp, making the shrimp more robust. And then we see uh, a big reduction in mortality. So that's just by replacing or including uh, feather meal into the diets of shrimp. So we, are, we need to look at this for lots of different proteins, especially blood meals and all sorts of things, which contain uh, a number of uh, peptides and uh, proactive and bioactive uh, components of the protein. Okay, so it just goes to show that fish meal alone is not the, the platinum standard. Now then, we're moving on to health. I've, I've mentioned that we are uh, interested in just not the fundamental nutrition, but the health of the animal. And so there's a quest for more feed additives with functional properties. And this is bringing together two disciplines to form a new science, to forge a new science of nutritional health. And one thing I should mention to you about shrimp to, to remind you, this is an animal that's changing its outside coating. It's, it's shedding, it's shedding its carapace, it's shedding its cuticle and has to resynthesize its, its external structure. So the, the, the shrimp is growing, but it's also going, uh, its length is increasing, then it stops and then it sheds its coat, then it builds another coat and it grows again and it sheds its coat. So here we have a molting stage, which is going to be very different to what we see in fish. So the metamorphosis is, is something we have to bear in mind. They are very different animals, of course, and they, we don't see fish doing this. So we will see here stage of duration, the post molt the intermolt stage, the pre-molt stage, the molt again, and the post-molt in cycles. So here, the feeding activity will be weak when it's post-molting. It's at its maximum during the intermolt stage. 40% of its life is in this stage, 40% of this cycle. And then we see the new, 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 the new cuticle is forming, and then the animal is decreasing its appetite. Then it goes through the molt stage again and then it goes into a very weak mode of nutrition. So we see staggering here and catch-up growth. So the shrimp is growing like that. So this, is, uh, this, this kind of dictates the way we approach 
the problems of nutrition and health. Because by the way, when they don't have a carapace, they're at their weakest. They do not have a structural defense outer shell. So they are more exposed to pathogenic um, insult and pathogenic invasion. Okay, so that leads me on to what can we do about improving the health of the shrimp through perhaps um, addressing functional feed additives and uh, the pathogenic threats of the biome, uh, the microbiome or the uh, ecological profile, eco, eco profile, the microbial ecology of the gut and what's on the surface of the shrimp and in the, on the gills and the exposed uh, membranes and epithelia would be critical to this. So the gut is the main um, area of interest to us in terms of feeding, but remember the gills of the animals too have a microbiome. And so the gut health and the gill health and even the surface of the shrimp will have a, a microbiome and, and nutrition can maybe modulate the uh, gut gill microbiome and improve the gut gill integrity. So this is a new area of research which I'm very interested in. We see a slide here that is a bit colorful, but it shows that the microbiota plays a significant role in the development and physiology of its host. We are finding out very similar things in all animals and humans too, that the gut microbiome is, a, is like another organ in a way. It has a, a major role to play in health and inflammation and the control inflammatory processes and is implicit in the story of diseases. So the microbiome of the Pacific white leg shrimp reveals differential bacterial community composition between wild, farmed, and those which have got these these diseases like hepatopancreas uh, necrosis or EMS outbreak conditions. We see big changes in this story. And the Mexicans have done some very nice work here to look at that. And I'll show you a, a slide soon about that. But let me just remind you of the types of feed additives that can function as functional ingredients in shrimp diets. We have the, the prebiotics, the probiotics, the prebiotics being the carbohydrates, the glycans and the beta-glucans, the mannon oligosaccharides, uh, fructan oligosaccharides, galacto oligosaccharides and inulins, which are termed the prebiotics. Then we have these probiotics, which can all influence the gut microbiome. Yeast, bacteria, these are the probiotics which are, can be added to the feed. And then these can improve, uh, they can be immunomodulations, they can improve gut function integrity. We can add exogenous enzymes to the diet as well to improve the uh, release of some of these uh, fibers and other proactive functional prebiotics. Um, protein hydrolysates are being increasingly looked at as, as um, functional feed components. These are protein hydrolysates broken down into functional dipeptides and uh, uh, oligo, oligopeptides, polypeptides. Phospholipids and emulsifiers, play their role. Organic acids and acidifiers can also stabilize the gut pH and hygiene and have an effect on modulating the gut microbiome uh, profile. And increasingly, many companies are addressing the role of phytobiotics. These are the bioactive herbs, extracts from plants and root crops. I, I'm involved with a very nice publication with my colleagues in Iran uh, on uh, phytobiotics and, and looking at uh, as a review on the whole question of bioactive herbs in um, aquatic, aquaculture health. Now then, um, looking at the uh, Vanamai, here is some studies were done in Mexico to evaluate the hepatopancreas and intestine of wild type and farmed cultured white leg shrimp. And they looked at the hypervariable regions of the 16S RNA gene of bacteria to identify them. This is uh, the area of next generation sequencing where we use molecular technologies, molecular techniques to, se to sequence the, the uh, uh, RNS, the 16S ribosomal gene, and we can then identify a whole host of bacteria. Uh, people are moving on to metagenomic now um, studies to look at the functionality of these microbes. So we are trying to understand better the relationship between um, the microbiota of wild, farmed and diseased animals. And we see that um, independent of the shrimp source, it was seen that the microbiota of the hepatopancreas and the intestine was different. Independent of the shrimp source, 
the microbiome of the hepatopancreas organ and the intestine seems to be very different. That's quite interesting. And the microbial diversity between the sediment where the animals are living in and the intestines was very similar. So the, the, the sediment at the bottom of ponds can influence the uh, microbiota of the intestine. And maybe then diet can play a modulating effect on that. But the early development of um, hepatopancreas necrosis disease, which is EMS, is associated with changes in the microbiome. And we see the appearance of specific uh, disease-related uh, bacteria. So there's been, uh, uh, this work is coming out of Mexico and a group there in, um, in uh, northern Mexico in uh, Sinaloa uh, are looking at that in Mazatlan in Mexico. Some very nice papers coming out to, to, to characterize the disease. Okay, now I don't want to blind you with this uh, slide, but it's, it's very colorful, I know. But this slide looks at the, uh, at the very complex differences between different farms and, and shrimp. So we see here the profile on a, a Vietnamese farm. You can see these are different farms in Vietnam, okay? There's about five farms there. Then we see a Malaysian farm profile between different farms in Malaysia with different profiles. There are some common, common areas, of course, but there's, a, there's some new bacteria there located and we see some uh, Vietnamese shrimp. Uh, we can then relate to the shrimp to the farms in Vietnam and we see Malaysian shrimp as well and we can compare the farm microbiome of the water in the farm to that present in the shrimp and then we can do these these uh, very complex diagrams to look at overlap which have got the common bacteria and which have various uh, we can do this uh, uh, analysis to quantitate the differences between the farms and relate that to the different shrimp these are these complex um, microbiome, microbiome mapping diagrams, which can then help us to better understand the variations and the likelihood of disease uh, becoming uh, inherent. So this is uh, an area worth looking at. And so this is a, a study of how a fish hydrolysate can, can influence uh, the, um, the uh, relative abundance of bacteria in the, in the intestine of shrimp. This is a study done by my Mexican PhD student. He doesn't mind me showing you this. Uh, we are going to generate a publication from this very shortly. But we included 0, 2, and 4% of a uh, protein hydrolysate in the diet. And we can see improvements in growth. This is a significant improvement in growth of shrimp uh, fed 2% and 4% of the tuna uh, protein hydrolysate from waste tuna. And we can see a better result at 2% inclusion, slightly less at 4. And we can then see the shift in the microbiome at different taxa levels. This is the, the phylum differences in phyla of bacteria here. Okay, so the relative abundance of the gut microbiota composition was um, changed when they received these liquid hydrolysis in the diet. Um, Kurt, by the way, has just got his PhD, so he's very happy about that. And then when you look at a more detailed structure of the bacteria at the, um, the familiar level and the species level, you see bigger changes. And then we can again map those bacteria against the diets. Or we can see there's some overlap, but then we find differences in the different treatments. So that proves that we can alter the microbiota just by adding a small amount of functional feed additive, in this case, the protein hydrolysate, the fish protein hydrolysates. So that's, that's very interesting. Now, one of the things that we should bear in mind is that, you know, this disease, this is caused by a Vibrio parahemolyticus. This is the basis for um, the disease of uh, hepatopancreas necrosis in shrimp, EMS, uh, early mortality syndrome. And it's very clear the differences between healthy fish, normal shrimp, and disease shrimp. Look at the differences. There's nothing much in the stomach of the disease fish. It's empty, it's atrophied, and the pancreas isn't visible very well, okay? So it's an empty midgut, whereas you've got a very nice uh, full gut here for the animals with EMS. So here we see it again very clearly, a dorsal view of the animal looking down. Aren't we lucky that shrimp are almost transparent, so we can see right through them. So we don't uh, have to, uh, we can look at the health of the animal visually. And here we see again, 
very clearly a lateral view of the stomach and the hepatopancreas and the mid intestine. Okay, that's the healthy shrimp. And then I want to just remind you that uh, diet plays a big role in the immunology of the animal. And the gut microflora will change under stress. The stress is going to be something that is critical here. Stressed animals have a very weak response. It, uh, it negatively um, impacts on the immune system and diet might be able to allow us to reinforce this immune system. And environmental factors play a role, the pond water quality, the temperature, salinity, stocking density, all these abiotic and biotic factors are involved and microorganisms, of course, in the pond may play a role as we've just seen in terms of gut microflora balance. And so all of this will impact the immune system and the immune system of shrimp is not like that of higher vertebrates and uh, fish have a, some degree of, of innate. They have, we have innate immune system and we have the acquired immune system. Fish have both, but the innate immune system um, based on cellular response is dominant and is, is basically the primary immune response mechanism in fish, in shrimp as well, particularly. And so in shrimp, we also have these new uh, class of proteins specific to shrimp called the defensive proteins or penaidins. These are complementary to the shrimp immune system. And these are functional proactive proteins which can trigger off a whole cascade of anti-inflammatory responses or even inflammatory responses and can modulate the immune system. And diet might play a very big role in this. And that's something we need to look at. It's not a lot of research done here. It's quite open research that's needed to validate this. But here we can see a very complex interplay and uh, will be at the heart of future research, I'm sure. And so the whole question is to populate the gut with healthy bacteria and to encourage a better quality bacteria to take hold. And this is where we need to basically, our mission is to exclude the, the pathogens and to populate the intestine with a balanced, healthy microbial ecology to promote the core commensal bacteria population. The commensal bacteria are the major ones for, um, for us to consider here. The ones that are going to be inherently um, populating the gut. And here's some examples of probiotics that can be used uh, from my colleague, Brian Austin. Here are a lot of different identities of positive bacteria, the various sources that can be, they can be found in and they can be used in different variety of conditions and methods of application. There's a whole variety of different approaches, both dietary and in water, husbandry and pond management to use probiotic applications. And so just to show you a graphic slide here that you can see and for the whole life cycle, we need to look at this, but primarily for us in terms of economics at this end during the production uh, phase and uh, uh, on growing particularly. But we can also add these probiotics, by the way, to live foods to enrich the live foods like Artemia to get these, these probiotics into the young animals too. And um, you see the effect of no pro probiotic addition on mortality, and we can see the benefits of probiotics and antibiotic control. Antibiotic control being blue. We don't want to use antibiotics as much as possible, of course. Our mission is not to use them, but we can see that we can get the benefits, the same effects with probiotics. So this is the way forward, I think, is to use more natural solutions. And then um, I mentioned functionality, uh, just we address that prebiotics are really nice because they are not probiotics, they're not living. So we can add them to the feed and we may not have to worry about thermal damage too much because they can survive the extrusion process. But the complex carbohydrates that you find in the, the cell wall of yeasts and other functional um, components like this, play a dominant role in our agenda. And here we see some examples of what a beta-glucan looks like. And these are uh, found in the cell walls of, of yeasts and uh, mannan oligosaccharides, glucans can be extracted from the yeast cell wall and purified. And they are sold as fractional ingredients. Uh, there are many companies out there that produce yeast, um, so many, and they all have very similar ranges of products. 
at different potencies and different production systems. But they have proven functional glycoprotein roles. They can interact with the mucosal interface to trigger off those immune reactions I mentioned, and they can improve invisible structural differences in the gut. Okay, um, so here we have them. COS is a chitin oligosaccharide, which you can get from insect uh, exoskeletal material or even from crabs, crab shell and shrimp. So the shrimp shell may have a role to play back in, in, the, in the aquaculture routing. And here we see an example vividly of what a beta-glucan and various fractions of yeasts and combinations can do to improve gut health. Here we see a control group with no added um, uh, yeast components. Here we see an intermediate um, use of, of these products. And here we see a full combination of beta-glucans and other components which can then uh, uh, display a functional role in improving mucosal fold frequency. We can see the frequency of the folds is increased, which increases the surface area of the absorptive epithelium of the gut. And we see a deeper muscularis layer. Here's a, a muscular layer of the shrimp gut, and we see a better structure. So overall, and thank you to Kurt Servin for this, from his PhD thesis, we can see an improvement in the absorption of nutrients from the gut simply by dietary management. And we have done the, uh, the gut microbiome to go with this, to complement the story. Okay, so um, innovation and enterprise is needed in aquaculture research. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research going on there. Um, I've got papers and review articles to read all the time. Um, it's nice to be playing a part in this um, enterprise myself, from the academic side to the uh, links with industry and with uh, especially with um, pathway intermediates and others in very different areas. It complements everything very nicely. Academia is driven by needs. Academia is driven by societal needs. It's driven by the needs of the consumer. And at the end of the day, you know, we say the consumer is king and the consumer is asking more and more questions about how we feed our animals. And it used to be that fish and shrimp would be uh, the forgotten ones, but increasingly are being asked more and more about the welfare of the animal. Are we using fish meal in the diets? Are we using or impacting on the marine environment? Are we using antibiotics? These are the primary questions that are being asked and the industry is nicely responding to that. And when you looked at on LinkedIn, those of you on LinkedIn and those of you are following the, um, the webinars from other areas as well, you'll see that these are high on the agenda. And it's nice to be uh, working on, on areas which are topical and will help us to feed the world of tomorrow. And that's a big challenge because increasingly we are turning to the marine environment for our food. So I think with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And I went over slightly, but I, I think we have a lot of time to think about questions. I'm sure there's a lot of questions to ask you and um, questions for me. So thank you very much. Thank you indeed.